Well, I'm glad to uh, be back with you again. We're going to be talking about Hebrews today. Hebrews is a great chapter that points to our great high priest, Jesus Christ. <clears throat> he says that in the first chapter of Hebrews, God, who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in times past, and the fathers by the prophets, but hath in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. And he says, But to which of the angels said he at any time, Sit on my right hand until I make thy enemies thy footstool? Verse 13. It's been interesting for me to study this uh, book of Hebrews. We find that Christ does have his enemies. We're living in a world where the ecumenical church wants to tell us that we're all God's children. Well, my question is, uh, if we're all God's children, then why does uh, Christ say that he's going to sit on his right hand until he makes his enemies his footstool? Uh, that doesn't sound like his children. In chapter 2 of Hebrews, in the seventh verse, it says, Thou madest him a little lower than the angels. Thou crownedest him with glory and honor, and didst set him over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet. For in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. But now we see not yet all things put under him. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death of for every man. Now the Arminians try to say that's universal atonement because it says tasting death for every man, but you have to continue in the context there because it goes on and it says, For it became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. So he didn't say uh, that through tasting death of every man, he was going to bring all, uh, every man without exception, unto glory. He said he was going to bring many sons unto glory. For both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all one, for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. There's a, a huge misunderstanding about sanctification. Christ is the one that sets us apart. We don't make a decision that we're going to go down an altar and become sanctified. Uh, God is the one that does the setting apart. In fact, he says here in the 11th verse of the second chapter of Hebrews that they who are sanctified, it says, for both he that sanctifies and they who are sanctified are all one because he's not ashamed to call them brethren. Uh, he, and he said, uh, verse 13, I will put my trust in him, and again, behold, I and the children which God hath given me. This is a parallel passage to some passages in John, the 17th chapter. I and my Father are one. All that the Father hath given me will come to me. So he says here, behold, I and the children which God hath given me. So in the 17th verse it says he it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. And as he, as we go in the second uh, third uh, chapter he says we're for holy brethren partakers of the heavenly calling consider the apostle and high priest of our profession Christ Jesus. Who, who is Christ the high priest for? Christ is the high priest for those who are partakers of the heavenly calling. If a person is not a partaker of the heavenly calling, Christ Jesus is not their high priest. Uh, verse 6 says, Christ is a son over his own house, whose house we are, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of 
the hope firm unto the end. And uh, he says in verse 12, Take heed, brethren, lest there be any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. There's many people out there that have departed from and now are uh, involved in, in false doctrine. The false doctrine is what I call uh, easy believism, fill out a decision card for God, for Jesus, and now you're one of his children. But Christ says that if you're one of mine, you will hear my voice and follow me. And um, he says in the uh, 13th, verse, 13th verse, exhort one another daily. While it is called today, lest any of you be hardened to the deceitfulness of sin. Verse 18, to him, and to whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest, but to them that believe not. So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. You know, now where does the ability to believe come from? That's the question. We find in uh, uh, a passage in John that says that this is the work of God that you believe on him. God is the one that imparts faith into our hearts. He's the author and finisher of our faith for the elect. So, in verse 3 of chapter 4, it says, For we which have believed do enter into rest, as he says, I have sworn in my wrath. If they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. So part of entering into the into the works of, of this matter is to understand that God has already done the work. The works were done before the world was even created. And once we understand that, verse 9 says, there remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. There's a great rest in knowing that Christ did the work uh, before the world was created. There was a covenant relationship between the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit that Christ would come, that he would in history and he would die for the sins of his people. And we see in chapter 5 of Hebrews, verse 9, he says, In being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation to all them that obey him. So we see a linkage between believing and obedience. He said in another passage that, you know, you will believe what I say. Part of obeying is believing what Jesus Christ himself said. I have often said that Jesus Christ was the greatest uh, expositor and teacher on election. More than Paul and more than Peter, uh, you look in the Gospels and you find that Christ is very strong on election. All that the Father has given me will come to me. And all that come to me I will in no wise cast out. I and my Father are one. In the sixth chapter of Hebrews it says, this is the Arminian's favorite passage to try to prove that a person can fall from grace. Okay? And this is a great uh, uh, debate within the doctrinal uh, minds of, of theologians have argued this for years saying that yeah you can fall from grace no you can't fall from grace well let's look at the fourth chapter the fourth um, verse of chapter 6 for it is impossible for those who were once enlightened have tasted the heavenly gift and remain partakers of the Holy Ghost and tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come that they shall fall away to renew them again into repentance Seeing they crucify themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. Well, I'm here to tell you that that is speaking of the reprobate. That is speaking of the person who has been a vessel of wrath created for destruction. And how can I make a statement like that? Well, there's only two kinds of people on the face of the earth. Those who are recipients of eternal life by God and those who are not. 
And we see in the 17th uh, verse of chapter 6, it says, We're in God willing more about me to show him the heirs of promise, the in, in, <coughs> immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath. Look, for the elect, what God has done is immutable. What that means is unchangeable. That's what his unchangeable priesthood is all about. You can't change it. It's irreversible. What God has done will be secured for his elect. He's the author and finisher of our faith for the elect. The 18th verse says that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before it. 19, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil. So, you know, for the Arminians to try to use this very passage to deny uh, God's ability to secure eternal life for his elect is blasphemy. <clears throat> it's placing in juxtaposition one who has not been a recipient of God's eternal grace to those who have. We see here that in chapter 7, <clears throat> the 17th verse, it says, He testified, Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Verse 22, By so much was Jesus made a surety of a better testament or covenant. 24, But this man, because he continued, continueth ever hath an unchangeable priesthood, 25, wherefore he is able to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. You know, an eternal priesthood means that there's no beginning of days and no ending of days. It means that that this, you know, you often hear the argument with the Arminians that it was the foreknowledge. Christ looked down through the portals of history and saw that we were going to make a decision for Christ. Well, first of all, no dead man can do anything, including uh, coming up out of spiritual death and dead trespass and sin and make a uh, decision for Christ. Christ was the high priest before we were born. He was before time. He was separate from time. In the 26th verse it says, For such a high priest became us who is wholly harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens. So, who is Christ the high priest for? Again, he is the high priest for the house of Israel. He says in verse 8 of chapter 8, For finding fault with them, he says, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, Verse 10, For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after these days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. It's all of the work of God. Verse 12, For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. He doesn't say here that... Uh, I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, their sins and iniquities. I will remember uh, for a couple years or maybe for six months. Or, this is an eternal covenant, an everlasting covenant that he's made with his people. And he says in the uh, ninth chapter, the 15th verse, and for this cause he is the mediator of the New Testament that by means of death, for the redemption of the tra transgressions that are under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. So who are the recipients of eternal inheritance? Who have been predestinated? Who have been called? Well, it says here, 
the ones that are called are the ones that are going to receive the promise of eternal inheritance. And <clears throat> to dispute any thought about universal atonement, we see in the 28th verse of the ninth chapter, so Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, not all, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time, without sin unto salvation. Christ completed his work on the cross. He said it is finished. In chapter 10 of Hebrews it says, verse 12, But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. Now, you know, what's really interesting about that is that the Catholic Church, uh, by instituting the Mass, each time they have that Mass, they say that the wafer becomes the actual body and body of Christ and so on, and they re-crucify Christ all over again every time they have the Mass. But Christ said that this man, Jesus, uh, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. And then again he talks about his enemies in the next verse. Look at that. 13, from henceforth expecting till his enemies he be made his footstool. So again, just to repeat, you know, if, if we're all God's children, then who are these enemies he's talking about? <laughs> okay. So, verse 14 says, For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. It isn't a temporary thing where you fall away today and then you're back tomorrow. He says that for by one offering he has perfected forever them that he has set apart or sanctified. And again he repeats in verse 16, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord, I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds will I write them, and their sins and iniquities I will remember no more. And uh, who is this high priest over? Well, in the 21st verse of the 10th chapter, it says that having a high priest over the house of God, over the house of God, he isn't the high priest over every man that's ever been created. He's the high priest over the house of God. And he gives a warning here in this chapter, in the 29th verse. He says, Of how much sore punishment suppose you shall be thought worthy who have trodden underfoot the Son of God, and have counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing, and have done despot under the Spirit of grace. What does it mean to do despot? To do despot is to, in spite of, in spite of, in other words, there are those out there who are doing despot to the Spirit of grace by saying that uh, an elect child of God can fall from grace. Okay, that's, that's basically taking the holy covenant the holy irreversible immutable covenant of God and spitting in the face of Christ and you know what Christ said he was going to do for those people that did despot to his grace what's he say in the next verse 30th for we know him that has said vengeance belongeth unto me I will recompense saith the Lord now you know, the Great Reformation was brought in uh, by a, a number of people who who took uh, odds with the Catholic Church and the heresies that were promoted, the idolatries, the image worship, the mariolatry, the, the uh, selling of indulgences, and Luther became very, very... Uh, convicted about this in the 38th uh, there's two places in the, that talks about the just shall live by faith one is in Romans and one is here in the 38th verse now the just shall live by faith if any man draw back 
my soul shall have no pleasure in him. You know, there's a distinction between those who are God's elect and those who draw back. 39th verse says, We are not of them who draw back unto perdition, perdition meaning eternal damnation, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. Okay, the key here, though, is to remember, always remember, where faith and belief originates from. Faith and belief originates from uh, God, from our eternal High Priest, Jesus Christ. Now, he makes a distinction in, in chapter 12. He talks about these great clouds of witnesses we see in the 11th chapter. That's the great heroes of the faith. I'm not going to spend a lot of time. Many people have talked about that, um, alluding to all those heroes of the faith. In chapter 12, it says here in 15th, verse of chapter 12, looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. Verse 16, lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. Uh, this is a, this is a, a warning, a warning uh, to all of us to make our calling and election sure. But in the 22nd verse, he says, But ye are come unto Mount Zion, and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the first burner, which are written in heaven, and to the God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect. Notice here in the 23rd uh, verse it says, which are written in heaven. Revelation, it talks about those names who are written in the Lamb's book of life. The 24th verse says, unto Jesus the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. And 28th verse says, Wherefore we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace, whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. The focus here is on the grace, the grace of God and His, His completed work. Finally, in the 13th chapter, he gives us another warning. He says in the 9th verse, Be not carried about with divers and strange doctrines. For it is good thing that the heart be established with grace, not with meats. In other words, not with uh, the works of man, not decisionism, not free will, not something that I've done, not uh, the works of our hands, but he's saying here with that, that it's a good thing that our hearts be established with grace. He says they have not profited by these or occupied uh, but these other things has not been profitable for them. And then he says the 20th verse of the 13th chapter now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus that great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the everlasting covenant. Make you perfect in every good work to do His will working in you that which is well-pleasing in His sight through Jesus Christ to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Okay, now one of the things I want to point out is that unconditional election teaches us that it was God's decision as to who would be a recipient of His grace. It was God's decision as to who He would call. And, you know, again, I know I point this out often, but the ninth chapter of Romans, that's what really secured it for me and rested in the grace of God. Because He says in Romans 9 11, for the children being not yet born not having done any good or evil that the purpose of God according to election might stand not of works 
but they have him that calleth. You know, this had nothing to do with the age of accountability, okay? It had to do with the fact that these children weren't even born. They hadn't even been born and conceived in sin yet. And uh, they hadn't done any evil or good. God said, Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated. This was a decision by God to show mercy unto Jacob and to create uh, a vessel of honor and to hate, and he uses the word hate, Jacob, and create him a vessel unto wrath or a vessel unto dishonor, a vessel of wrath fitted to destruction. And why would he do that? Well, he says in the 22nd verse of Romans 9 that uh, what if God willing to show his wrath to make his power known endured much long suffering the vessels of wrath did this destruction. So he did it to make his power known. And he also did it that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy which he had prepared before creation unto glory, or for prepared unto glory. So this is a beautiful chapter of Hebrews talking about what Christ did to his great high priest, and we're going to continue this next time. Uh, we're going to be doing some studies in Colossians later on as well, and we'll see that, that if we had to rest in our uh, flesh, or in our decision, or in our ability to raise ourselves to life, we would be of all men most miserable. You know, when Christ was standing before the tomb of Lazarus, he said with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. Lazarus could not raise himself to life. That will be all for today. Look forward to continuing this next time.